only thing we have to fear is beer itself. Beer. So many choices. Oh, we no function beer well without. Woohoo! Beer! Hello and welcome to another episode of Beer Busters. We're going to bring you the news and reviews of your favorite brews. My name is Dan Baker. I am joined by my co-host and brewologist. Steph Hefner. And the demented and fermented Wayne Baker. We're still in quarantine. Here we are. Social distancing. Well, uh, Wayne and I not so much, but we live together. So I think that's like we're, we're allowed to be less than six it's, feet apart. It's not possible for us to socially distance from each other. Yeah, this is very much true. But I think st- we've got a good six inches between us right now. That didn't sound right at all. It didn't at all, and our elbows are probably like an inch apart. Uh, Steph, however, is socially distant from us, and uh, yes. and has a new microphone. Yes, yes which it's beautiful, and it's quite large. I did want to uh, say we should mention. Um, now we're going to get into what this episode's all about in a minute, which is uh, super cool and super important. What we're talking about, but we have three different interviews we're presenting today as one episode and the microphone came after the first That's interview right. yeah, so the oh. Steph's audio is going to sound different in the first video than video than uh, I'm sorry interview than the other two there's going to be a, a sudden increase in quality it's going to sound like it sounds like now because we're actually recording this after the facts so yeah good old podcasting and editing and, and all that fun stuff uh, we I'm w- going to listen to this episode just to hear the difference in the audio quality <laughs> Uh, we will get into the topic at hand in just a second. I do want to remind you that as you are listening to this, you can follow along to the Beer Busters world at Beer Busters on Twitter and Instagram, Facebook. We are Beer Busters Podcast. There's also BeerBustersPodcast.com and Patreon.com slash Beer Busters where you can find your way into access to Last Call and punishment videos if we're ever not existentially being punished. Uh, and the behind the scenes feed and when we're allowed to have recordings where people can show up and we do them at the Beer Busters basement, you may get yourself an invitation to one of those events. And it's all for as little as a dollar a month. Yeah, and one thing we might now, we don't know how long we're going to have to do the podcast this way. At this point, it might be forever. Um, but we have been sort of slowly, incrementally increasing uh, uh, what the equipment we're using specifically for doing a, a, an over the Internet podcast interview style like Steph's mic, but one of the things we've done is we've upgraded our software as well, so we might start actually like doing the video recordings That'd be cool. and maybe yeah. putting that on oh, Patreon. Shit. That's, uh, <laughs> Steph's not happy about that. Clearly, we didn't talk about this before um, we were recording. Uh, also, because nope. that would be super easy to do. We could just upload the raw file and just be like, there exactly. you Because yeah, then you go. not only would you get the video, you would get the complete uncut podcast. Oh, we could even oh, do like a, we could uh, do a Patreon-only live stream, too. We could do live streams. Yeah, we could. Although, no, I guess we could. I was a little concerned about bandwidth, but I think we could make it work. Yeah, I think it'd be fine. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, this isn't a promise or anything. It's just an idea we kind of talked about a little bit, and I wanted to bring it up now. <laughs> While we're all on the spot. Yep. <laughs> well, I'm on board, but let's indeed get to the topic at hand. There's been a lot of things that have happened socially recently, uh, including lots of um, protests, all in the vein of Black Lives Matter, which I think I speak for all of us when I say, yes, black lives do fucking matter. Now, the beer industry has jumped on board with that, and there's a very exciting project that was started by a brewery in Texas called Weathered Souls Brewing. It's called Black is Beautiful, and what it is, basically, it's a it's a project that they started where they'll um, have a beer style, they'll let breweries use this style of beer and riff on it as they please, but every brewery that is participating has to donate 100% of the proceeds to a charity that supports this movement and as of recording there are over 900 breweries that have uh, signed on board now I don't want to go too far into detail because we were lucky enough to talk to like Wayne said three people first of whom was the founder and CEO of Weathered Souls Brewing Marcus Baskerville who is the guy who came up with the idea and he's going to get into a lot of detail on what uh, spawned the idea and where it's going and what the future may hold for it as well but we also had a nice conversation with uh, Tim White, who is from Harris Family Brewing. And I've wanted to talk to somebody from Harris Family for a while. And it turns out Tim and I are friends on Facebook, and I think he is with, with you guys, too. Yeah, we all kind of traveled in the same circles. I mean, being an up-and-coming brewery in, in Pennsylvania, specifically in the Harrisburg area. I mean, we're in, in Philly, but we've made a lot of friends out that way over the years. So we've we've kind of sort of crossed paths a little bit, but this is the first time we got to sit down and talk to him. And what's really uh, um, 
cool is when they open, which hopefully will be sooner than later, they will be the first black owned, wholly black owned brewery in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, first of more to come already, uh, two locals here in Philadelphia that will be right on their heels. So, um, yeah, and they even had a, an article in Forbes about that that we didn't get to. Yeah, we didn't talk touch to them about that. in the interview, but yeah, they've been a lot of press and they're like you said, all over social media. Yeah, really cool guy. Yeah, very, very, very happy for uh, for what they have going on. And then the third interview that we have is our buddy Sam from Bond Place Brewing, uh, who is taking part in the Black Is Beautiful collaboration. Uh, we'll get into plenty of detail on that with him in his segment, but there's a lot to talk about and a lot of very important things that need to be said. So I'm going to shut up. And we're going to get to that first interview with Marcus from Weathered Souls Brewing. Here you go. So obviously there's a lot that's been happening uh, around not just the country, but the world recently. And conversations that are very important to not only have, but continue talking about. And very, very important topics. And I'm glad to see that the beer community is is diving in head first in this. There's a wonderful project that's up and running. And more breweries are jumping on as we speak. It's called Black is Beautiful. It was started by uh, a man who's from Weathered Souls Brewing out of San Antonio, Texas. And wouldn't you know, we are lucky enough to have with us right now Marcus Baskerville, the founder and CEO of Weathered Souls. How are you, sir? I'm doing well, yourself. Doing fantastic, man. Thank you so much for taking time to join us. Oh, man, thank you for having me. It's much appreciated. Oh, of course. It's, it's a wonderful thing that you're doing. So for people who are not necessarily aware, why don't we fill them in? What is the Black is Beautiful project? Yeah, Black is Beautiful is a call. Originally, it was all the breweries in the U.S., but it's obviously gone uh, worldwide at this point. But it was a call to all the breweries, basically, to join in a collaborative effort of growing a stout, which uh, recipe we created here, and then uh, use those proceeds, donations, to support uh, organizations for equality and justice and inclusion. Uh, for people of color, uh, black people, and other uh, demographics. Now, is it uh, a recipe that was created specifically for this project, or is it one that you'd been brewing at Weathered Souls? No, so this recipe was actually specifically created for this project. And it is a uh, a high ABV stout, correct? I would say a mildly <laughs> high ABV stout. Of, <laughs> yeah, 10 and a, ten and a half percent. Uh, normally, our stouts range anywhere from 12 and a half to 14, um, so I'll say mild, uh, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, so 10 and a half percent, uh, like medium body, uh, but it's more to the to the ode of the classical style. I mean, um, obviously, breweries can get creative as they want, so I'm sure there's going to be some pastry options of it, uh, but the actual recipe itself uh, really doesn't have too much pastry aspect to it. It's more of the... Uh, drier, um, you know, more chocolate, roasted character stout that we used to see back in the day. Yeah, I, th- I like how now, 10% is mild for Texas. <laughs> well, <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. I've never been to Texas and 10% is mild for well, me. For, and for Dan. <laughs> he likes his big <laughs> beers. So for the breweries that are participating, and I know you're over 900 breweries right now um, participating, what is it that you're asking those participating breweries to do? Um, so those breweries are going to donate 100% of those proceeds. Um, but then also uh, we're asking that basically they work on a long-term plan uh, for inclusiveness and equality. So obviously some breweries already do that, have minority employees, different stuff like that. Have already There's breweries that have already implemented um, – like internships, stuff like that. But basically we want these breweries to start doing the same, you know, implementing a long t- a long term goal to make some change within their brewery, their community, that type of thing. You know, the beer is one aspect of it, but at the end of the day we don't want we don't want it to get lost in uh, you know, the beer being one thing and then that be it. We want people to think about the long term and the long haul. Does the fact that over 900 breweries have committed to this project and continue to the, to uh, focus on this long-term goal, d- does that bring you hope and uh, positivity in this time that it's kind of hard to be positive? Yeah, um, it's definitely a humbling experience to see this many people involved uh, within the whole entire initiative. My original goal was like around 200 breweries. To, so to see 900 plus breweries involved is absolutely amazing. Uh, but yeah, it does bring some type of hope that, I mean, it's crazy because we look at the brewing industry, right? And we have 900 separate businesses plus 
involved in one initiative for social investors for equality. And you don't see that in any other industry, any other business format or anything like that. So, I mean, it says a lot about the brewing community as a whole. I think it's really great, too, including that, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, initiatives, collaborations um, to, to donate for a specific cause that a lot of breweries, I mean, the brewing industry has always been really good at, at, about getting in on um, all kinds of charitable causes. But to sort of add that extra layer to say, like, also, we want you to actually, you know, make a plan to to be uh, knowledgeable about being more diverse and more inclusive exactly. as an industry kind of yeah. expands beyond just the, you know, oh, we're going to raise money for a cause, but we're actually going to institute changes in, in how we do our business. That's really cool. Exactly. So um, Weathered Souls, you guys are giving a part of your proceeds to the Know Your Rights campaign. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So originally when we uh, planned this, our goal was to go ahead, uh, give proceeds to the Know Your Rights camp and then uh, do a local organization. But as it kind of grows, um, as we get more people involved, as, as we've had people want to match our donations and different little things like that, I think I'm going to actually spread all of the love locally. Um, I just haven't figured out exactly the entities that I want to donate to. Uh, because of the, uh, I mean, we did three batches of the beer, so we're going to have a large amount of uh, beer going out. Um, so I kind of want to spread the love amongst more than one person. Um, I just want it to be meaningful, uh, so I haven't really decided exactly who we're going to donate to yet. Can you talk a little bit about the, the label design for the beer? Yeah, uh, so the label design was basically to highlight kind of the same thing as the sound idea to show the different hues um, and shades of black, like literally within the name, you know, black is beautiful. So let's highlight these different shades because black goes all the way from, you know, a light caramel brown to black is black. So, you know, um, we basically wanted to highlight that, um, show the different color hues. Uh, Kevin of KD Designs did a wonderful job trying to get my vision onto the actual physical label in itself. Um, and then for our version, um, we did uh, one with Tommy Smith uh, from some of the individuals that uh, raised their fists during the Olympics. Um, what was that, back in the 60s? Um, so, I mean, that's the route that we went ahead and did for ours. Um, I know a couple other people have gotten pretty creative with theirs as well. So, you know, the idea was kind of to just highlight those different shades of black and then for our particular label, I wanted to kind of highlight um, more of the social aspect of it. Now, when exactly did you uh, kick off the, the initiative? The initiative actually started uh, June 1st, so we're almost at a month right now. So then that quickly, you're at over 900 breweries, several countries, every state. That, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, uh, like I said, it's definitely a humbling experience because I didn't ever think that it would uh, get that far at all. Um, but to actually, you know, hit that point in that amount of breweries, uh, it's, it's really crazy. So we, we mentioned, you know, several countries. Um, it should be worth noting, so we, we've already said two over 900 breweries. Uh, every every state, if, if I'm not mistaken, is represented, but also 17 countries what yeah. is what's the furthest reach that you've seen or what's a country that's just it's blown your mind that it's gotten that far um i won't say one that's specifically blown my mind uh but it's crazy to see breweries in japan and china uh well it's germany um brazil uh we had i think the one that uh struck me the most was we had a brewery in, in rwanda and actually, like, uh, that's the coffee that we're using in one of our variations of it. So, you know, to see different things like that, it's, it's amazing. That's exciting. And it's been exciting to uh, touch base with um, breweries that are local to us and, and brewers that we've interviewed on the show and um, hear their variations on the beer and also to hear the hype uh, in the beer drinking world and everyone uh, trying to get their hands on the beers and finding out when the beer is being released. There's definitely a lot of positive hype uh, around this project. So it's really exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, we'll be releasing ours on uh, 4th of July. I've started to see other breweries start filtering theirs in within the last week or so. Um, I know there should be some more releases in the coming weeks. So it should be fun to kind of see when people start dropping their beers and uh, what people's opinions are and what they think. 
So now, obviously, this is a project that has grown out of a lot of uh, uh, the things that have been going on in the world uh, lately. Um, have you as a brewer or as uh, Weathered Souls as a brewery, is this? Uh, have you been involved in charitable causes before? Have you done a lot of collaborations, or is this sort of the first big project like this that you No, done? so, yeah, uh, as far as collaborations, that's been pretty much a part of our uh, production for quite some time now. Uh, we've done quite a bit of collaborations uh, locally within Texas and even uh, nationwide with a lot of different breweries. Um, so originally when I had made this plan, no, I didn't plan to do a collaboration of any type of sort. I was just going to do the one release and then, you know, make a donation. It was, uh, Jeff from Jester King that actually like, um, suggested turning it into a collaboration. And I was like, you know what? That's a wonderful idea. And then we kind of just went from there. I also want to mention that on, uh, now the project, you guys have a website for it is, uh, black is beautiful dot beer. Uh, there's also not only is the recipe on there for commercial brewers, but there's also a homebrew version of the yes. recipe as well. So homebrewers can get in on the action. Um, I was yeah, quite so, excited uh, when I saw that recipe. So what? 2013 homebrewer of the year, Annie Johnson went ahead and uh, and came up with an incredible recipe for homebrewers that they want to go ahead and brew the beer, participate, you know, however they want to participate. Um, and then you even have uh, local homebrew shops. Uh, participating, making kits for them. Uh, Brooklyn, Brooklyn uh, uh, Beer Shop went ahead and did a like nationwide kit for it that you can buy online right now. So yeah, it's definitely um, even hitting the homebrew market and stuff like that. I've seen a lot of people start brewing it. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's spreading out everywhere. Yeah, definitely all over social media. I've seen everybody, every beer, every beer type thing that I follow is, is definitely talking about it, which is really cool. Um, Good. Now, I know this is uh, an initiative, obviously, to raise money uh, for, for causes, but also to sort of spark conversations about change and diversity in general, but also specifically in the craft beer world, which has traditionally been a male, white dominated industry. Um, in a broader mm -hmm. sense, is that something that you see changing? Do you think um, these sorts of conversations that are coming up now are going to because I the beer world's becoming more diverse and has been on that trajectory for a while. Do you think that that is increasing now that this is a conversation that, that people are having uh, more broadly? Yeah, definitely. Uh, people, I mean, basically that was the goal, right? So the beer is one aspect of it. And then outside of that, um, the conversation dialogue and what grows from that is the main goal of the initiative. Uh, you know, the beer is only one aspect of it. Once the beer is gone, you know, that's that. But we know inequality is not going anywhere. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, this raises some conversation within communities uh, that typically don't see the large demographic of African-American people of color who's coming into their breweries, um, but also just in general as a community raising discussions uh, because that's where a lot of the issues lie with what's going on now is the lack of communication, the lack of discussion, there's always the rebuttal and nobody wants to listen. Um, so I think, you know, as that gets treated, as that goes on, um, as people start speaking a little more, uh, people of other races uh, start listening to people of color about what their points are, what their issues are, um, I think we could go ahead and probably get a lot further than what we are right now. Absolutely. I agree. And it's really heartening to see. I know we have, um, we talked about talking to some other uh, local breweries that are participating in the collaboration there's um uh among a lot of the newer breweries that are opening up that are representing a more diverse uh sort of demographic uh, harris family brewing here in uh, pennsylvania the harrisburg area is uh just recently blew away their fundraising goal um a black owned oh, okay. brewery out in harrisburg that they're getting started and they're, they're participating in this collaboration so i think we are i think our uh our boys from country club brewing are opening yes. up in uh, pennsylvania as well yeah yeah, so yeah we, they just brewed theirs with uh, our friends at Bond Place in Bethlehem. So yeah. that's exciting. Okay. Mike Cromer is a uh, good friend of mine. Yeah. So oh, very cool. That'll be another, yeah, that'll be another minority brewery that'll be opening up out there. Yeah, really cool to see the diversity uh, increasing in the beer world. Very awesome. Very. It's always been a very arms open, inclusive kind of environment, but. You know, like anything else. Yeah, I mean, it's there. it's inclusive. It's inclusive in the sense that I've never had any spark back from being in the industry, right? Right. Uh, from my mentors, from the people that have supported me, 
uh, getting into the beer industry have reached out to help me uh, as far as getting to where I am have all been Caucasian males outside of uh, Michael Ferguson and Mufasa. Uh, but outside of that, everybody has been white male that has assisted me in the progress of where I am now, even dealing with a lot of the support with this initiative. I mean, the first people that reached out were Caucasian, Caucasian men to assist with the initiative to help out you know, uh, ask me whatever I needed, um, you know, that type of aspect to it. So, yes, the industry is, uh, the demographics definitely need to change, but I don't think that, mind you, this is, again, my experience. So, obviously, there are people that have faced racism, uh, have also had issues getting loans, different things like that, depending on where they're at in the markets. Um, so, there are definitely obstacles for people of color to get into the brewing industry, but for most, there isn't. Um, but, you know, dealing with the overall um, aspect of how many it is to the people of color, you look at, we have 8,000 breweries, and I think there's maybe 60 that have some type of black ownership. So that gives you, you know, the, the broad perspective of what the percent is as far as, you know, how many of us are actually in the industry. And I think with the Texas, so you figure we're, uh, as large as Texas is, as many breweries as there are, I'm the only black-owned brewery in Texas. Wow. Well, in Harris Family and Country Club, uh, and uh, there's another one in Philly. That, so we'll, we'll have three, but uh, before then there were none. So it's exciting yep. to see that the <laughs> diversity continue to grow. And as a woman who has brewed and has uh, an education in brewing, you know, um, it's nice to also see a lot more women in brewing as well so definitely so if people want to learn more about the project uh black is beautiful dot beer you are also using the hashtag black is beautiful beer that people can follow yes. on so, social media tag when you start drinking the beer yeah start tagging and showing everything black is beautiful beer um the website black is beautiful dot beer um everything that we've been doing has been organic as far as getting the message out there uh, it's been all sharing from social media, that type of thing. Uh, so if you don't see your favorite brewery on there, the local breweries, go ahead and tag them, uh, reach out to them, let them know to get involved. Uh, the timeline for this isn't, you know, going anywhere. So obviously people can get in where they fit in. Um, you know, the whole thing of, oh, well, we don't have the extra money to spend on the, the beer. That's not really the case, dealing with the fact that there's so many vendors that want to get involved to help with ingredient costs and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, if people can get in and join, it'd be absolutely amazing. Very cool. I've got one last question for you before we uh, we let you go. Did I see right on the Weathered Souls website that there is a virtual 5K for this? Yes. So there is a virtual 5K that's going on for this. Uh, so you can go ahead and get signed up for that as well. I think we have the link on our Facebook page. I don't know it off the top of my head. Uh, I want to say it's yeah, I don't know it off the top of my head, but yeah, definitely go ahead and get signed up. And then uh, the donations from that also go to the cause as well. Um, and then today is also the last day for the custom ink fundraiser. So we're doing a custom ink fundraiser for merchandise, shirts, t-shirts, um, tank tops for women, sweatshirts, and then uh, some like uh, slides and hats. Uh, so today is the last day for that. Um, all of the proceeds at this point, since we've met the minimum, gets donated uh, to our local organizations. Well, so go ahead and support that too. That's great. Awesome. When we uh, when we publish the episode with this interview in it, we'll make sure to put all the applicable links in the description. So if you're listening to this now, you want to participate in any of that, go to the website, uh, go to the uh, description of the show, and you'll find the uh, the links for where you need to go for that. That being said, Marcus, thank you for one for for joining us, but two, thank you for putting together such a powerful project in a time when we really need some kind of unity out there this is an immense project that you're you're putting on it's great to see how many people have joined and, and i'm sure it's going to grow from here thank you so much for everything oh thank you and thank you for having me those kinds of words and um you know i'm just trying to do what i can to, to support remember it's black is beautiful dot beer is where you can go to find out more again marcus thank you we're continuing our conversation today about the uh, Black is Beautiful collaboration project. Uh, it's been going on 900 plus breweries, as we mentioned, countries all over the world, every state. Uh, we have with us uh, from a Harrisburg brewery that's opening up in the near future, uh, also involved in the collaboration. Um, joining us from Harris Family Brewery is uh, Tim. How you doing, Tim? 
I'm great. What's up, folks? Good to see you. Hey, Good lady. to see you. Thanks for coming <laughs> on. Um, so we've been seeing a lot of you on social media for a while now. You guys are all all over the social media talking about your upcoming mm-hmm. brewery. Um, lots of really cool content. Obviously, you guys are also involved in the Black is Beautiful project. Um, also, when you guys open, you will be the first black-owned brewery in the state of Pennsylvania. Yes. Uh, which is pretty cool. And then uh, coming right on your heels is um, two uh, two locals. Uh, yes. Also another black-owned brewery that's going to be opening up um, in the uh, not-too-distant future. So we'll talk yeah, a little in bit. In Philadelphia. Yeah, right here in our backyard. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about your uh, collaboration. But first, let's get started to talk about where uh, Harris Family Brewery uh, came from. How did how did the brewery start? How did you guys all meet? And what made you decide to open a brewery? Okay. Um, Sean Harris is the brewmaster and that's where the harris family brewery comes from a lot of people think the harris is from harrisburg because we're in harrisburg right. but no it's really from his last name being harris and originally me and him are from philadelphia born and raised <clears throat> and then our families transplanted us to harrisburg and we've been here ever since so he started making beer well, he got a homebrew kit from his wife for Christmas, I believe. And that's what sparked the the, biz, the everything. Uh, so he started homebrewing. Uh, I'm not sure how long was he homebrewing before he gave me my first taste. So I married into the family. Hopefully he was brewing long enough that your first taste was good. Because usually the first couple batches <laughs> was, you make aren't that it good. It was good. It was, it was okay. It, it was, was okay. okay. Right. It was enough to uh it was enough to spark my interest. Right. So I married into the family and they kept having they they would have regular cookouts um uh, every weekend. It was like a summertime thing. And he had, a, he had the biggest backyard, so everybody would come to his house, and then it would be 20-something people there just having a good time. So like I said, I get into the family, so I'm the new boyfriend. Um, but when I would come, there would be a lot of liquor and not a lot of beer. So, And I'm not a big liquor drinker. So I'll be like, all right, I know from here on out I need to bring my own beer. So I would bring... I would come in double fist in two thirty packs of Budweiser. I said it. <laughs> hey, I nothing wrong with that. We I all start somewhere. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with the mac. I'm drinking a PBR yeah, right yeah, now. Trust me, there's nothing wrong with, with those macro <laughs> beers. They ha- they have their time and place. Right. So I would be like the MVP because I was the guy who always brung something to drink other than the bottle of liquor that people brung for themselves. So uh, that happened for some time. And then one cookout, he hands me this dirty colored drink <laughs> in a mason jar. And he's like, hey, in a mason try jar. this. And I go, okay. Um, so I drink it and it's drinkable. I'm like, what is it? What's going on here? He's like, yeah, I just, I made this in my kitchen. I've been home brewing. And then he, start, he starts educating me on craft beer and home brewing. Like right there in that backyard. Hours later, and a couple glasses later, um, I was like, "Yeah, we need to make more of this, and we need to sell it." <laughs> so day one, from drinking one sip of it, I was like, "Yeah, I'm into this." Uh, and then from the next couple days and weeks and months, we just started YouTubing everything we could about the craft beer scene in Pennsylvania. Back then, it was booming flop flourishing if you will um and that's when i saw there was no black people i was like oh okay um which surprised me like i searched from here to 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 the other side of pennsylvania and the big names started popping up people in new york people in these bigger states there there are black people brewing beer in other states and they have been for a very very long time uh, just this is one of those things that Pennsylvania j- missed out on. Um, it just, it just, you know, craft beer just isn't our thing. So unless you're really, really introduced to it, you can it can blow right by you. And 
JT, so it's three of us, me, Sean, and JT. JT was a cousin who was always in the mix. And him and Sean started homebrewing together because Sean needed a partner, like, you know, just to keep an eye on things. So accidentally, JT became the co brew. <laughs> so also like the janitor like he probably does most of the cleaning. Also, also the janitor yeah uh, and the heavy lifter yeah the assistant brewer always has to do the heavy lifting no i'm always the heavy lifter oh. <laughs> yeah, that's your job all right they look like they're the heavy lifter but they're not the heavy lifters <laughs> <laughs> and i was like the business guy so i i from the door like i know a little bit more about brewing now but in the beginning I cared less about the process. I was just like, let me know when it's in the glass. <laughs> I'll drink it and tell you if it's good or not. I'll drink it and tell you if it's good or not. So, uh, but they always kept saying like, no, we're going to teach you. We're going to turn you into a brewer, blah, 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 blah. Right. So um, I always knew that this was like a place where we needed to be. Yeah, no, And it's been a good thing. It's interesting because a couple of things you mentioned that I, uh, are common themes we've come across uh, with a lot of breweries. We've had on our show a lot of breweries that are either in planning or just opened up. And uh, a lot of times you'll hear, I got started in brewing because my wife bought me a homebrew quit, quit kit, uh, <laughs> usually for Christmas, sometimes for the birthday, but it's usually for Christmas. And then there's also a common theme for uh, breweries that uh, are successful is that it's a team of people where there's one person who's all about the beer, at least, and then there's another person that's all about the sales and the marketing and getting the name out there. So it's it's really cool you guys already have that that dynamic in place. And, you know, like I said about seeing you guys all over social media, I mean, you definitely you definitely got a knack for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The free stuff is uh, easy to me. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, cool. we're, we're big tech kids, so it was easy to just pump content 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 oh uh, but you got to do it every day you definitely yep. gotta gotta keep it's it a, out it's there. a skill yeah especially now because it's a crowded market i mean there's yeah every day there's more and more breweries opening up um now you guys had a very successful gofundme campaign and one thing that i thought was unique about your campaign is you started with one goal and surpassed it and then you pushed the goal higher and surpassed it and i saw you guys just recently push, push the goal up again so yeah. first of all congratulations and that's amazing but how do you keep building momentum uh and then what's your ultimate goal uh to use all this money so last year no two years ago we decided to crowdsource and then it took us six months to research crowdsourcing and what's the best way to do it and all of this and all of that. So we started with a Kickstarter. The Kickstarter failed. Um, uh, I can't even remember where we had the Kickstarter at. Yeah, Kickstarter is like, a tough one, man. That's, I mean, a I lot think of it was 25,000. Yeah. I think it was 25,000 yeah. Kickstarter. Um, and, you know, the Kickstarter idea is hypothetical money. Like you, you pledge an amount, but it doesn't come out of your bank account yet. And if you don't hit your goal, you don't get anything. And then it just erases. Everything goes away. So that failed. I think our social media following just wasn't big enough at the time. Like we thought we were big, but we weren't. <laughs> uh, so I put that on the back burner for a year or two. And then I was like, all right, 2020, I'm going to start the GoFundMe because I wanted to start a GoFundMe the first time, but I lost the, the voting <laughs> and we went with the Kickstarter instead of the GoFundMe because people, people consider a GoFundMe not to be professional. Like it's really. Yeah. I've, I've, I've seen people with that stigma, but I mean, that's the beauty of it. You yeah. can source your money for anything and this is as legitimate a goal and a reason as anybody else's. Right. Yeah. Right. GoFundMe is definitely, we started a GoFundMe years ago. We yeah, wanted to when start we first a, started. It, uh, uh, a business for the podcast. And, hey, uh, Kitty. Yeah, yeah <laughs> Moo's been trying to. We've been trying to keep her from stepping on the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, I, GoFundMe. It's it's simple. It's easy. It's not hypothetical money. You, you, you if you don't hit your goal, you still get the money. So right. it's it it's effort that's not wasted in the long run. Absolutely. And we were at the point where anything helped because I had a location, or I have a location, 
I actually had three locations so far. This is our third location. The first two didn't work. And I'm glad they didn't work because they were just like, the more educated I got, the I realized it was just small and just ill-shaped and just wouldn't have worked. So they failed for a reason. But this place we have now is a good uh, industrial manufacturing place. So we started to go fund me in January of 2020. It started off to a strong start. I think we got to like 6,000, 7,000 pretty fast. And we were like, oh, we're going to make it. <laughs> um, and I think our goal was 15,000, the first okay, goal. Okay. Um, and then it stalled at like 75 or something like that. And I just let it sit. Um, wasn't pressing it too much. Just kind of just was letting it in the God's hands. And a couple weeks what, two months ago or a month ago now? A month. I say a month. A month ago now, we got a random donation, like just $25 just on a, like a Saturday morning or something like that. And I'm like, wow, I almost forgot to go fund me was right. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, okay, so I'm going to share it. And I shared it, and then another person donated. And then I just kept sharing it. And then people, and it just snowballed, like in one weekend, we literally hit our goal in three days. We were at 15,000. Like I was freaking out. I went live on Facebook for like, I did it for as long as Facebook would let me before it kicked me. <laughs> I remember I playing, that. I was going to say, I remember when that happened. I remember seeing it all over Facebook. You guys were just I like was playing music and they were like, nah, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was amazing. And it just kept going. And yes, we hit the 15 and I'm like, this is amazing. I couldn't even talk. Like I was just so excited and everyone kept saying, raise the, raise it higher, raise it higher, raise it higher. Like in the comments and in the donations. And I was like, well, all right, let's see what we can do. Um, and then I believe we took it to 25 and a week later, I think we did that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! And, and now then, it's at it's at what sixty thousand now? Is your okay? Is your goal so right now, now the tar- now so we hit we got to thirty right. That was nuts. And then my financial advisor was like, "Take it to a hundred, reach, <laughs> reach, reach for the sky." I'm like, "What are you talking about, dude? No, I can't do a hundred. Um, even though the thing is, everyone knows we're going to need more money, but." I just wanted to get my foot in the door. And then I believe traditional lenders would start showing us some respect. So that's the game plan. Right. Get right, the foot yeah. in the door, show, show a dollar coming in, show five dollars coming in. And then people are like, Oh, okay, this is real. Here's a loan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. It gives you a little bit of credibility to walk in. So I'm not trying to I'm not trying to fund the whole brewery. Um, I just wanted to get my foot in the door. But yes, it is at sixty. The thirty slash the fifteen slash thirty is going to get us to producing beer. Like this is definitely going to happen now. Once these government offices open back up, we're going to apply for our last license. Um, we're going to nip a few things in the bud inside the brewery. Like we were able, so first we were starting with a two barrel system because that's what we were home had. That's what we had, and we were home brewing, and we we putting that system together. Well. Immediately with the funds, I'm up to four barrels already. Wow. And that's great. So, like, everybody said you want to be in the four to seven barrel spot. If you're going to start small, you need to be at four to seven. So, we're already at four. And I have I have a pretty aggressive plan to get us to seven to ten barrels pretty quickly. Now, one thing on your website that stood out to me, you said that uh, when you step into your tap room, you will be immersed in hip hop culture in an experience unlike any other craft brewery in Pennsylvania. Can you help us imagine what that's going to be like? Uh, I'm still working on that, but (laughs) let's just say the hip hop theme is going to be very relevant. A, you're going to see black people as soon as you come in. Um, That is already something that's very far in between. We're really cultured and artsy and like cartoons and movies. So stuff like that, not, not so much like 
local local art, but more or less movie stuff, heavy rap cultured stuff, music playing, and just a, a good vibe. Any kung fu movies? <laughs> Definitely some kung fu <laughs> and some anime in there if nice. I can fit it. Nice. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's pretty cool. I've been to a lot of breweries, and I ain't going to front. There are some good vibes in these places. People people create some really some good spaces. It's a it's a it's a brewery in Pittsburgh called Couch Brewery. It's literally full of couches. Like <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> it's literally full of couches. I love it. Um. <laughs> Well, there's there's one then, in uh, uh, where is that? Where's Root Down? Oh, in Phoenixville, Phoenixville Root Down. Right. They yeah. have a, a very uh, uh, hip hop sort of aesthetic. Yeah, in, and that's in where the, the kung fu movies come yeah, into play. They, they play kung fu movies there in the all back. day, every day. But it's it's oh, a really cool okay. vibe. You you walk in and yeah, they're playing you know hip hop and R and B and 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 some you know old school rap throwback stuff. And they've got like graffiti all over the walls. So you're right. Like there's it's a really cool vibe, and it's something you don't get in other businesses. Beer is something yeah. where you can you can incorporate that kind of stuff. Yeah, most places are a little bland. The yeah. beer is good, but the aesthetics are bland. Like it's really neutral. Um, so we're going to try to get some good art in there. Yeah, nice. you definitely you have to inject some personality. And something we've been saying for yeah. the last couple of years is when you open a new brewery. Like it used to be, you open a brewery, all you got to do is make good beer, and that's it. But now there's so many options. You have to make a cool place to go. You know, yep. so it's really key to focus on not just making good beer, but also making a cool place, having a good atmosphere, having personality, having a cool vibe. And we plan on having the, I wouldn't say normal events, but events to keep people in there and having fun. The trivia nights, the movie nights, right. the, uh, we're doing a spades night. You know, we're big spades players, so like, you nice. gotta do stuff like that. Nice, <laughs> nice. Uh, of course, you guys are part of the the Black Is Beautiful project. Um, but you have done two collaborations with this uh, project, correct? You did. You brewed a collaboration beer with Love City and Two Locals uh, on June twentieth, and then also with Trogues on June twenty third. So the Trogues one got pushed back. So technically, as of today, we only did one. Um, yeah, they had some technical yeasty problems, and and and, and we had to push it back. So, hold on. We can did. we uh, isolate technical yeasty problems, please? <laughs> oh, I plan oh, on it. No. Great sound clip there. <laughs> I love it. Uh, sciencey stuff. I don't know. Sciencey <laughs> stuff. That's fair. That's fair. I mean, if you're going to trust anyone with sciencey stuff, Trogues is someone to try. Well, trust. Yeah. <laughs> but I think we have a date for next Thursday. And don't hold me on what number that is um, early July. But tomorrow. We're brewing with Evergreen Brewery oh, cool. here in Harrisburg. They're over, uh, I believe, in Camp Hill, technically. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we, I, I love that place. We uh, we recorded there a while ago, a couple of years ago. We're doing a three-way uh, brew with Wolf oh, nice. Brewing and Evergreen Brewing. Oh, cool. Very cool. And I love both of them guys. I, I don't get to Evergreen as much as I want to, but I, the times I've been there have been very pleasant. I want to I wanna talk a little bit more... Um, I have one question. I want to talk a little bit more about your experience with like black uh, culture in the beer industry. But something I thought about when we were talking about your fundraising, having the coronavirus pandemic pop up right when you're like sort of in the middle of raising money. Do you think that hurt or helped? Because I feel like if you're if you're spreading it around online, people were maybe online a lot more and seeing it more because they weren't going anywhere. Or do you think people were less likely to donate just because of the uncertainty of everything? It definitely helped. Yeah. The the new cell phone culture that we're in right now, like people thought we were always in our phones before. <laughs> yeah. It's way worse now. It's true. <laughs> um, I believe online shopping, I don't know the statistic, but it has to be up like 3,000%. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I think Amazon literally, like, they started doing stuff on their site to slow down traffic. <laughs> because it was it, they would they it was it was too much happening so uh yes i believe it helped i believe i also believe it was people had a little bit more money to give right now yeah uh because our daily hustle and bustle was like slowed down right even though the job stuff hurt like a lot of people weren't working and stuff like that but 
most people were okay. Yeah. And like we, I was just asking for a minimum donation. Actually, I didn't have a minimum, but I, I would say if, if, if this many people gave us $25, this is what we would have. So I just kept saying that. And what's crazy is people would donate more than the $25 that I was just throwing out there. And like being black in the craft beer scene has been really good. I'm not, I'm not going, I'm not going front. Like the, the, the local brewery love brewery love period. I went down to Florida and I mean, people don't know who I am down in Florida. I'm just a, a, a guy drinking. But I started doing my social media thing while I was like at the end of the bar. So I'm posting, I'm tagging, I'm drinking. And the next thing I know, the guy comes up to me. He's like, hey, are you? And I'm like, yeah, I am. And then it was just like a super party. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, wow, I'm in Florida and it's going down like this. So um, the brewery world is really uh, acceptive of, of us and what we're trying to do right. now. Online is a different story. The the, the, oh, the public says. is vicious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they can be. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. It makes you think of something. When we were talking to Marcus, you know, I had mentioned about you know how the craft beer industry is really inclusive and and open to to all you know people from all no. walks of life. And his response was interesting because he was like, "Yes, in that they're always willing to help out regardless of who you are. You know, they want to help you do the same thing." <clears throat> but the flip side is like. When he started the Black is Beautiful project, the first wave of people that reached out to get involved were all white people, because yep. the industry is still largely, yep. um, is largely white and largely white dudes. And and one thing when you talked about looking for you know uh, black people in the the craft beer industry and, and specifically black breweries, and how you didn't find any in Pennsylvania, I'm curious what that equation looks like. Do you think on the side of the consumers? Do you think is there is there a level of diversity on the side of craft beer drinkers that's maybe different than the side of those making it, or do you think it's just sort of a reflection? That's a great question. Thanks. Um, I think it's a reflected. I don't think a lot of black people drink craft beer. And are there some? Yes. Are there a lot versus how many beers there are and how many different places there are to drink? No, not even close. Um, it's kind of like wine drinkers if you will like there's not a lot of men wine drinkers like that's really like a female lane now do men drink wine yes but we're, we're not buying 24 bottles of it at a pop <laughs> yeah it's yeah, whipping out a wine bottle right now um so they're you know females are the biggest consumers in every market but we we as in black people don't understand craft beer yet uh, the flavor profiles aren't something we're used to. The price point is definitely something we're not used to. And then craft beer was never marketed to us. Like the things that we're hooked on was shoved down our throats. <laughs> Malt liquor was shoved down our throats. Billy D was out <laughs> here in his Star Wars selling Coke 45s to the generations of people and he still is like if i go down the street to my local hood bar here in harrisburg there is a cardboard cutout of old ass billy d <laughs> with a beard so marketing has a lot to do with it and then let me speak to the flavor part again ipas sour beers triples barrel age like that's like talking a different language to somebody in my neighborhood. They have no idea what I'm talking about. We understand liquor once again, because it was marketed to us and there's bottom shelf liquor, top shelf liquor, medium liquor, brown liquor, white liquor. Like there's so many different, you know, so many different ways you can get to it. Um, Craft beer, I don't think, ever tried to help people get to it. I think it was just like, hey, we up here, we taste like this, you like me or no. And yes, a lot of people go, okay, I like it, and I can afford it, I'm, I'm into that. But a lot of people was like, you want what, for how much? 
And why does it taste? What's that? What's that taste? I want. Is it bad? Is it? What's that? What's that hop taste? So yeah, that's how I was with IPAs when I first started uh, tasting beer. I was like, yeah, I'll never. I'm never drinking these. I drink three or four IPAs a week now. So like, my my tongue and my palate has changed and learned to appreciate the taste. But it took a while. I'm not going front. Yeah, it wasn't there's a journey. Like the first sight. There's definitely a journey involved. And and you mentioned you know the the price point and all. Even you know when I got started in in craft beer, I was kind of really taken aback by the price point. You know, I could go to a bar and I could get a piney yingling for like a buck fifty. And then I go to a place that wants to charge me $7 for the same amount of beer that is super duper hoppy and I don't like how it tastes. You know, it's people are are in a a comfort zone and it's a big ask to get them to spend more money to step outside of that comfort zone. Yes. Until someone really financially tries to bridge that gap. I don't know if we're going to do it. I don't know what's going to do it. Um, But that's going to be. You know, Yingling figured it out. Let's let's just say that. Like, yeah, Yingling is a craft beer. They've been around for forever, but they figured it out. They they figured out the producing that mass amount, and it's everywhere. But I will say, like, I have to talk people into to drinking a lager sometimes. It's like, nah, we don't want that, Tim. You you can drink. Get a picture of that for you. And they get us a picture of this 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 Miller Light because they want to drink that. I'm like, no way! No <laughs> way. It, hurts. it hurts. It hurts. <laughs> it hurts. So bad. Oh man! So I know you said you don't know if you guys are gonna like bridge that gap at all, but is that something you're keeping in mind as you're going oh, forward? Oh, absolutely. Um, I I do have a plan for it. Um, I do plan to take drinkers um i'll just say that like like aggressive marketing guerrilla marketing type of plan uh um just just want putting it in people's hands and actually marketing it to them um is what we're going to do locally really heavy in harrisburg because it's easy to do harrisburg is not a big big city and i compare it to philadelphia that's like humongous (laughs) <laughs> like it, you, you could be in Philly and never see somebody ever again, but Harrisburg, you'll bump into somebody by accident that you went to elementary school with. Um, so I think that we can convert the big beer drinkers into uh, sometimes craft beer drinkers. I don't know if it's like all the time, but some. And then some people are just going to drink it because we're black and it's like the Obama effect, they call it. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. It's like, hey, what you got? Yeah, I'll take it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and that's cool. But I believe you just got to like. I used to run a mentoring group and it was like my day job. I, I mentor ex offenders in the prison system. So that's what I do is a, my day job. And people hated coming to the groups like groups. No one wants to go to groups. Um, and they just kept trying to trick people and call it something else. I'm like, no, no, it's a group. <laughs> we come in, we're going to sit in a circle or we're going to sit classroom style and we're going to talk about our feelings and how to not commit crimes. <laughs> um, yeah, there's no soft way to put that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the thing was to mandate it or not to mandate it. And what it came down to was I told them mandate one class. If you come to one class, I will do the rest. And the classes lasted actually 16 weeks. I had over 50% people staying the 15 weeks. Wow. Wow. Uh, Because all you got to do is get that one class in and you're like, Oh, it's Tim. Oh, he's a regular guy. Just like me. And then you and you, and it just keeps snowballing. It's like, hey man, what you doing next Wednesday? Come on back. So I believe that's going to happen with our beer. I believe you put that one glass in your hand, and we're going to talk. I'm going to talk you through, or someone is going to talk you through, or there's going to be some literature next to the glass that's going to explain what's happening, and 
and people are going to get it. Are you going to do like a, like a an ask the brewer kind of thing if you want to you know educate the the masses? We're going to do everything we possibly can. <laughs> I like that. That's a good answer. And you're right. Education yeah. is ed- education is paramount, uh, not just in craft beer. I mean, in general. Right. And Period. and there's always a behavior that can be improved upon with some form of education. Yeah. Like drinking better beer. Like drinking better beer. <laughs> like drinking better beer. We actually have a uh, brewing class here in Harrisburg now at our at our community college. Oh, cool. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. But I I don't know how many people of color have been in there, but (laughs) I know they got it. And now once we tell people, once we show people how you can get into this industry, I believe more people will pick up these kits. And because we got scientists, we got scientists, we got engineers, we got biologists, like people, people are really smart in our neighborhoods, but we only think we can, we have to, we, we got to go to college and you got to get a degree and you got to go into one of these other fields. So now just letting people know that this is a field you can go into and Oh yeah, you can damn near teach yourself. Now, of course it's experience based. So you, that's why we do so many collabs because we learn so much from these other brewers. Like these guys are so smart. Uh, I don't know if you know Theo from, uh, they're from zero day, zero, zero. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think he's like literally a rocket scientist almost, <laughs> like legit. I believe he, like before he, I think he stopped being a rocket scientist to make beer. Make beer, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was talking to him about that once. He like he had a really good cushy government job, and they looked at him weird when he said, "I quit and I'm starting a brewery." And like, why are why are you going to work harder and make far less money? <laughs> so. These guys are really good at what they do. Uh, Sean, I can't even talk to him sometimes. I just be like, I don't know what you're saying, man. Like, <laughs> you got to talk to one of these other brewer guys. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, yeah. And that's all about representation. That's all about, yep, I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it. Now you can do it. And probably faster. That's usually how it works when someone kicks the door down that the next person Comes smashes a little, a little yeah. easier each time. Yeah. 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 And uh, it's interesting. Uh, when you talk about, you know, the lack of black uh, representation in the, in the craft beer industry being sort of a consequence of the marketing, um, yep. which isn't really an angle. I don't know that I've ever really thought about before, but it makes perfect sense. And it's also like, you think about the craft brewery, it's, it's suburban, it's, you know, higher class neighborhoods. It's right. It's very much. And there's also the other, the business side of it. You know, one thing we've heard is that, you know, just going to get a loan to start a business as a black person can oh. be such an uphill battle, you know, because there's just, there's, they don't, it's just so much harder to, to yeah. get your foot in the door and to start the process. Yeah. And it's like you even said, Tim, you know, you're, you're hoping to take your crowdsourced crowdfunded big chunk of cash to a lender to say we've already raised this we're taking this seriously please like actually give us a loan it, it, it's a yeah. shame that you would have to do that really right um <clears throat> it is a shame and the things i've heard that white people had to do to get a loan even blows me away sometimes <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like i'm not going to act like it's a, a golden ticket for 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 everybody it's easier, but they still have to sign their souls away. And it is very, very, very stressful once you do get, what, $2.5 million loan, like something nutty. Um, those guys really can't ever sleep good ever again. <laughs> uh, and it's extremely pred- predatory. That's that's the oh, problem. Yeah. I, I need your firstborn, yep. your wife, <laughs> hey, your yeah. girlfriend. Like your cars, I'm taking all the tanks. Don't worry, all of this is mine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it gets it gets really rough with the loans. And in the black community, we don't start talking about credit. I didn't learn about credit until I was 32. Wow, yeah. 30, wow. 30. Let's say 30. I'm 36 now, but like I really didn't learn about it until I needed it. And then I was like. Oh, 
that's what those numbers represent. Um, but before that, we don't talk about it in our youth. Yeah. Uh, and it's and it sucks. But people are trying. People are getting better with it now. But even still. We're not talking about it in elementary. We're not talking about it in high school. Yeah, that's the thing. I I didn't know, I didn't know what credit was talk either about for it in college. Right. I mean, you only get to talk about it in college if you're like you know a, a finance major, more or less. Right. You know, I right. I didn't know much about credit until I was in my twenties, and I found out that my credit score was kind of shit, and that's why I couldn't you know <laughs> get a couple extra hundred dollars for the car that I wanted or something. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's because. That it, we go back to the education. The education isn't there. They're teaching. They're not teaching you real applicable things like that when you're going through the school system. You don't learn how to do your taxes. You don't learn about credit. You don't learn how to. I mean, it's not a thing anymore. But balance a checkbook, even. Right. Like checkbook. Right. What's a checkbook? I know. Right. I know. <laughs> yeah, but it's it, it goes back to more or less a failure of the education system. Yeah. Well, yeah. Absolutely. Hopefully, that's the first failure right there. Yeah. Yeah. First, I mean, we could do a list, but yeah. Hopefully, right. like you said about kicking the door down, like you guys, the success that you've had and the the support, the sort of grassroots support, really, with your, your crowdfunding Absolutely. will make it easier Absolutely. for the next batch of, you know, black people or other minorities or other people who just aren't in the industry now to to, to be able to, one, say, oh, I can do it. And two, for the, the powers that be that make it easier for you to do it to say, oh, you know, maybe this, this is worth investing in. And then where are the investors? Yeah. Like that's like uh, that that's mind blowing to me. Um, the couple breweries that I did hear about, that I know about, and I heard hear about, that I know about, they started from like husband and wife, or husband wife, dad, mom, cousin, 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 brother, 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 brother. <laughs> it's like 12, 13 people technically on the you know starting the brewery yeah and then they they, they weed them out it's like you, you you come in with that seed investment and then you make your money and then we buy you out and you, everybody goes their merry little way like that's beautiful business but it's like non-existent in certain places other than people who really know how to use that the power of people yeah and i'm sure somewhere along the way somebody is probably equated the grassroots campaign and, and starting from a homebrew kitchen to, you know, some of the, the more uh, established businesses starting in a garage. You know, Bezos started Amazon right. in a garage. Steve Jobs started Apple in a garage. Well, the thing is, they were already well to do before and they maxed out some credit cards because they had good credit and they were able yeah. to do so. And then they made their billions and billions of dollars. But it started with the more money. Like they didn't yeah. have to worry necessarily about the Series A, Series B funding, and have to worry about angel investors and everything. They were they were wealthy, and then they got wealthier. Right. Now their ideas were crazy. Yeah. And 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 I believe our idea to make beer also shocks people with crazy. People are like, first of all, as big as I think we are, I could walk down my block right now, and somebody would be like. I have no idea. <laughs> Don't know what you're talking about. Uh, what? Um, and I, and that always surprises. It also fuels me. So like sometimes I I do so much heavy social media stuff because of that. I'm like, nah, you gonna know me down the block. <laughs> <laughs> Making beer and selling it is a crazy idea. <laughs> I personally, and I I speak for most black people we don't think about where beer comes from we don't think about where liquor comes from it's hennessy you know what i mean it's good it's just there (laughs) yeah it's there every day um i don't think we understand batches barrels um how long it takes to make beer like people people are like oh yeah we saw you made beer in philly last week when can i get some is it really? Do you have it now? Like my inbox is full of people who are asking me, <laughs> "Is the beer ready now?" <laughs> and I'm like, "No, it has to ferment. It yeah. has to takes time. See, see you in a month." Yeah. Once again, education. Yep. It all it all uh, stems back to that. But we don't we don't think about where our water comes from. We just know that I turn the faucet on and the water starts pouring out of this puppy. Yep. It it's not just beer. It's everything. It's just our American 
minds. Yeah, it's it's instant gratification and not caring about the process to yeah. get there. Sort of that, like you said, like a tap mentality. Yep. Oh, I just turn it on and it's there. Yeah. You know, you know, it's totally I know there's there. a pipe somewhere that leads the water to my house, mm. but pff, I don't. I don't think about anything beyond that. It's it's cool. Right. Like you talk about like with with not knowing where beer comes from, but I think also the other side is that not realizing that. I mean, pretty much anybody can make it. Yeah. You well, know, it's, absolutely. It's not it's, like it's, it's really that hard. It's and it's super legal. <laughs> <laughs> that is key. That Trust is key. Me. There is some other other areas of 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 usage <laughs> that people are doing every day in their kitchens mm-hmm. that is not legal. This is legal up to a certain amount of I don't know the exact amount of barrels one person can homebrew but i know it's a lot yeah per person in your household so a lot <laughs> i never even thought of the limit on that i knew you could homebrew i um, just i mean probably more than you, oh, would, you could consume it's more than sure. you can consume yeah, yeah yeah it's more than you can consume now obviously we all know that you can't sell one drop of it <laughs> right right that's true so that's where the events come into play where part. you buy your, your ticket to the event and then you get to sample all the home brews that are there right so there's there's right. where there's a will there's a way and it's not direct sales obviously but it's it's a way to get people to pay for the thing that you have made in a sense and in a sense a lot of a lot of people whispered that into our ears year one year two yeah and we adamantly shot all of it down. Um, I heard the PL, PLCB don't play no game with, with certain things, and they will they will bar you for life. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've seen people lose their driver's license before they actually had a driver's license. So I understand that mentality Jeez. of, that you you can you can catch a DUI before you're eligible to drive, and they will give you a 20 year suspension. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to circle back. We've been talking about a lot of different issues, but I want to circle back to the beer specifically okay. to sort of close out our conversation here. What kind of beers have you guys been making? What kind of beers are you planning on making? Do you guys have certain styles that you stick to, or are you kind of all over the board? I know you're not like the beer guy, but can you just give us a little info insight into that? So we're we're not into a specific style. We plan on um, brewing a little bit of everything, trying to finding our niche because we don't know. I don't know if our lager is going to be popular. I don't know. You know what I mean? So once we know, we'll know. But we do. We are slated. We do have some flagships. The only thing I don't think we have like slated slated is IPA, honestly. Surprising. Interesting. Um, yeah. Every, Everything else we've talked about doing, um, we're just not in a rush. We just feel like the IPA game is getting just punched all in the mouth every which way. And yes, we will find our own IPA and are okay with it, but we're definitely not calling it New England IPA. My guy Sean's a... uh, strong Philadelphia Eagles fan. He said we will never call anything <laughs> like that in our brewery. <laughs> so from the door, we're going to have to just recreate the whole name. <laughs> we, we might be okay with a juicy IPA or yeah, something yeah. like that, but he's he's adamant about never having a New England IPA in our brewery. <laughs> I, I support that. I'm on board with that. I get it. I get it. Each one of us has a style that's like to our liking so i'm a lager guy so our lager beer will be motorcyclists driving down the street um jt he's the short stockier looking guy his beer is stouts so he have a we have a beer name for him bando black um and that's going to be a stout and then i have hfb lager and then Sean has Formula 58, which is kind of like an ale. Uh, so yeah, we have some we have some things, and he's from 58th Street in Philadelphia, so that's the the basis behind that name. Currently, I do all of our graphic design and T-shirt stuff, and all our social media. Like it's, it's a team effort, but so that's yeah, that. I did I did want to plug your uh, merch store on your website. You have quite the unique 
it's always every time I go on there, there's brand new stuff on there. Are you, um, the the designs? So that's yeah. on HarrisFamilyBrewery.net slash shop. So I think, yeah. do you want to talk about the merch a little bit? So when the Black Lives Matter stuff just started happening, I personalized it, and I was like, well, what can I do? I'm a t-shirt guy. I literally have a t-shirt company in my house. It's called TW3 Designs. I named my t-shirt business after my son. Um, so I'm Timothy White Jr. My son is Timothy White III. Um, so that's where TW3 comes from. So I've already been making shirts way before I was making beer. Uh, so that's what we did. And, and it just worked out because I've been able to fund a lot of stuff with t-shirt monies um, and use it for the brewery. Um, so that's beautiful. But yes, the Black Lives, I have a lot of Black Lives Matter content on the site. A, because I just get these things in my head and then I just wake up and I just throw a mock-up together. Um, so yes, every day it's like one or two more shirts on there. Uh, when the mask started happening, I started making masks. I was like, hey, I got to do my part. I literally went out and bought a sewing machine. Um, and then I was like, there's no way I'm about to sew all these damn masks. <laughs> good intentions. No way. So I found some good substrates that I use, and then I personalized them if people wanted them personalized. So I, I'll make sure to send you guys a beer buster mask. Yes. <laughs> nice. Oh, Definitely. <laughs> Especially now that it's like mandatory. Yeah, to leave you have out. to wear one once yeah. you go outside. It's it's not going away anytime soon. Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah. That's definitely uh, true. And luckily, I've been able to stay safe. Like my kids were home for all of us were home for a long time. They just went back to daycare two three weeks ago. Um, we haven't physically been in the brewery as much because of this stuff. Um. Thank God for Zoom and, and things of that nature. The beer is, oh, okay, the Black is Beautiful beer. So the first beer we made with Love City is a stout. Tomorrow's beer is going to be a stout. Trogue's beer is not going to be a stout. Ooh. I believe Are they I, doing a, still. Somebody's doing a Black IPA. Someone is doing a black. I don't IPA. think it is them, but somebody was doing it, which I thought was a cool Not take yet. on it. I think ours is going to be like a lager, like a oh. dark ale, dark oh, lager. Cool. From Trogues, I, makes sense. I started with. I don't want it to be black. I want it to be brown. Yeah. And then the scientist people started doing stuff. <laughs> <laughs> started plugging in the numbers. So Sean and John Trogner. So first of all, I've been friends with John Trogner for, I want to say since. Brewers of PA symposium or event like a year or two ago. Of course, you go there and all these big wigs are there. And I went and shook his hand and introduced myself. He's like, oh, yeah, of course I know who you are. And I was like, oh, no, no, I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> so I, was super, I was super fanboying out. And he's like, you know, here's my business card. Give me a call. I'll give you a tour. We'll just do something one day. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so like, you know, that's what everybody was doing. Everybody was handing people business cards and just shaking hands and kissing babies. That's a perfect <laughs> description of that event. <laughs> <laughs> I kid you not. First of all, we drank like almost all night because there's like a beer festival after the event. The very next day, eight o'clock in the morning, I'm at work. I get an email from him. Like, hey, man, I'm just following up from last night. Just want to. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what is happening right now? He emailed me the very next morning. Um, and then he just opened his door and it was like, hey, man, we can talk. Look at this. You know, I'm from I'm from Harrisburg. That's where we started. So it's, it's near and dear to my heart. And let me know if I can help you guys with anything. So we just kept communicating since then. And then the Black is Beautiful stuff happened. I emailed him and was like, hey, man, I don't know what you're doing this month, but uh, you want to do a beer with us? He was like, of course I do. And next thing you know, we put it on the calendar. 
So he he was very uh, pro it as soon as I offered up as a, um, an option. And then, like I said, so everyone's getting the same recipe, but you can tweak it mm-hmm. at right, your yeah. will. Mm-hmm. And the cover art is like different shades of brown, like black to brown. And that's supposed to be representative of different shades of people of color. So that's why I wanted to specifically do something brown um, in color and profile because I want I want the beers to show that. Right. And I hope someone, you know, does something even a little lighter because that's the that's the I the idea is to have the conversation. And it's a tough conversation and people are mad they have to have it. White people are mad they have to have this conversation. You know, I will say one thing white people are good at is being mad over shit they shouldn't be mad this about. This is true. <laughs> um, but it's a great time to educate each other on... It's unfortunate that is so many polar things pulling us in different directions. I believe if it was just one issue, this would be easy, but it's not. It's not. It's it's four or five different things. Um, every day you got to make a decision. Now, now people are the polar thing is the mask or no mask. The the protesters versus police. The 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 white versus black. Trump versus everybody else. Women versus Trump. And and, and so like it's so many different things that you now have to pick a side on. And I'm. I like people having to pick a side. Like I, there was, there's way too many people playing in the gray area and, and talking behind people's back and behind closed doors. And now nobody's hiding anything from you. It's hard to hide something. Now, now you got to speak your, from your heart and hopefully we can come into a common understanding over sharing a beer together. Like that's the, the beautiful thing about beer we're not going to start drinking and then start killing each other because we're drinking beer. No, we're going to start drinking and we're going to start having really good conversations. Like I've closed out a many of bars or uh, breweries talking. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, Tim, y'all got to go outside in the parking lot. And, <laughs> <laughs> then we're, and then we're literally in the parking lot still talking. So beer is a craft beer because all beer and all drinks don't do that. Some <laughs> some drinks turn the conversation into something else. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> but the right craft beer, the right environment, you can have one of the best conversations with a complete stranger you have ever had in your life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely true and we've had those conversations i mean that's that's part of the fun of doing the podcast is that's that's what we're doing we're sitting around drinking beer and talking you know yeah and it's, it's really it's a it, great community thing it, it's a good thing that we it, it's a good outcome to a very bad event yeah yeah that's a good way to put it yep. and i think it it also puts some hope as well um because you know, especially this project that marcus has started you know, he's made it very clear that it isn't just about the beer and it's not just going to end with the beer, but the conversations that are going to continue to happen and and the commitment that these 900 plus breweries are making um, to acknowledging and making a, a difference in the world of inequality. And I think that at least makes it put it puts it on a hopeful note, if nothing else, as as Absolutely. uncomfortable and, and negative of, as everything seems to feel right now. Absolutely. And our white allies are doing a really good job <laughs> that that's every every revolution has had white allies so like I, I know it's like a key word now and people are like ah, i don't know how i feel about that word i don't care how you feel about that word there were white allies hiding slaves um when they were running away from places like you know what i mean yeah that's always been in our history there's been a group of people who want to oppress people and people who were like, no, I know I, I know that person looks like me, but I don't agree with them, and I'm going to help you. And yes, a lot of them died for it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that that's how hard 
even in 2020, that we're going to have to go for each other uh, to mean what we mean. And, and it's just all over the place. So, like, I, I congratulate people who I, gra- I congratulate the allies who have have still stood on our side and and they get it. Yeah. And then some people have apologized and flat out said, I'm sorry for taking this long to get it. And that's okay too. I get it. Last year was really crazy. Like when Kaepernick was kneeling and everybody was like, ah, the flag. People didn't get it. And that the whole time we were trying to say like, stop looking at the flag. Yeah. It's not about the flag. It's about murdering people, unarmed black people. That's what we're talking about. And people refuse to talk about it. Like, nope. Nope. It's kind of like, when I'm talking to my girlfriend or something and I raise my voice and, and then as soon as I raise my voice, it's like everything I say. So I got a whisper of my kind of whisper of my, my complaints because as soon as I raise my voice, she stops listening to me because she's not into that. It's the same thing. Like, but what I'm saying is still right and, and, and deserves attention. So 2020 just revealed a lot of that. Yeah, and and you know you say about allies and uh, of all sorts. I mean, you can't you can't change a society without engaging everyone who is a part of that society. And you know, Absolutely. we're I mean we're just a little crap beer podcast. You know, we're not we're not changing the world with what we do, but we can acknowledge our space in the industry that we're in and the things that can be done in the space that we do have influence over in the circles that we travel in. And it's, it is really reassuring that the craft beer industry has been and continues to be open to not just being inclusive, but also actually using what they have at their disposal to actually affect change, whether it's a collaboration like this, whether it's donating money, whether it's hosting events. I mean, it's just an amazing industry for, for that, for making society better. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's very well said. Well, Tim, we uh, I know we originally told you it would probably be about a half hour at most. We've had you for about an hour. That's <laughs> what happened. We had a great conversation. I know, exactly. We had yes. a great conversation, yeah. and, and listen, the time listen. just flew I by. A, I watch a lot of Joe Rogan. Y'all going to have to step your game up. It's like <laughs> three-hour marks. You, we, have, we might have to go three hours. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what I wanted to mention at the close, uh, and I think we're getting there now, is uh, normally when we do the podcast, uh, you know, before the world went crazy, we would actually go out to breweries and spend two, three hours just sitting around drinking beers and talking. So once you guys are open, once we can go out into the world safely again, we would love to come by yes, and definitely. sit down yes. and continue this conversation for an entire night over several beers. Yes, Absolutely. For sure. Yeah. Looking forward to that. Very much looking forward to it. In the meantime, you out there listening to this, if you want to learn more, go to harrisfamilybrewery.com or .net. They both redirect to the same place, apparently. Uh, and you can donate to the GoFundMe and, and help these guys hit their yep. goal, uh, which is- Or it's, you can buy a shirt. You buy a, a shirt. Hat, yep. Anything. Yeah. I need, I need more tank tops, Tim. <laughs> I missed out on the tank top, and I'm so sad. I just got more tank tops. I'm going to yes. post it tonight. There for you, you go. You, yes. you spoke it right up. I'm ordering a tank top tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. I'm going to have it up there. That's Perfect. awesome. Well, uh, of, of course, keep an eye out for, um, you know, all the happenings from uh, Harris Family Brewing, uh, from the social media and whatnot, and, and the various collaborations with different uh, breweries in, I guess, Eastern and Central PA. And hopefully yeah. we'll get to have. Which, which are going to be a lot. Good, good. Yeah. Especially with you know the the project that we have, you know, this whole episode is is focused on the Black is Beautiful project. That's that's so great that you guys are able to partner with other breweries in the area to uh, you know to do your part with it and and help spread the word and be part of that conversation. That's um, something that we definitely need. So uh, all that to say, Tim, thank you so much for uh, for taking some time with us, man. Yes, thank, thank you for you having so me. Much. Oh, Appreciate of course, you. and we're definitely looking forward to uh, to doing a full episode with you. Hey, what's up, everybody? How's so, it going? Okay. Oh, good enough. Fine. What about you? Doing all right. We're good. Figuring out cool. new podcast technology. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, as you can see, I'm not. <laughs> hey, you made it work. We can. And hear you, you learned how to change your name. Yeah. What do you mean, <laughs> Captain Techno Wizard over here? 
Who's that, me? Yeah, that's you. <laughs> that's what it says your name is. <laughs> well, how the fuck does it say that? <laughs> it just knows. Uh, These machines are uh, so smart nowadays. How long has Zoom been around? Zoom's been around for, for years. Yeah, for a while. It just got really popular okay. because of the so I, virus. I must have used it at one time, and I must have done that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I actually... <laughs> Several years ago at a job, we had a client that insisted that we use Zoom for a meeting, and none of us had any idea what it was. Right. Because we all yes, use Skype at the time. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm definitely, like, get off my lawn, resistant to any of this stuff. Fair so, enough. So, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, you're making high-quality Instagram videos. Uh, it's true. Uh, yet Nicolini is making <laughs> high-quality Instagram videos. I went to school for filmmaking. That's but right. back in my day, it was still called filmmaking. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so wait, this is like this isn't like this isn't live, right? Right. No, no we're no. Just, we're recording, and it'll it'll air what next Friday, I think. Next Friday. Oh, but yeah. it, it gets like edited down and all this stuff. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. No, this, yeah. This, we'll this we'll this do is... a, a legit intro. Cool. No, we okay. won't. This is it. Anyway. We started. <laughs> yeah, it's like all this well, is staying whatever. in. All this is whatever. in. Captain Techno. <laughs> whatever. <Wizard. laughs> whatever. <laughs> yeah, I don't want you to lose the Captain Techno Wizard. <laughs> I, I've already lost him. Or <laughs> they. Or whatever. Anyway, how is Howard's family doing? Well, we uh, yeah, we had a great conversation with Tim. Actually, yesterday we ended up doing it because they couldn't do today. We did yeah, they're night. at uh, 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 Evergreen. 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 Yes. I saw that yeah. this morning. That's and are they doing? Are they brewing Black is Beautiful today? Is that what's going on? I think yeah, so, yeah. they're I brewing think was, yeah. it with uh, with Evergreen and with Wolf Brewing. The three yeah. of them are collaborating. Right. Yeah, and then they're doing a, awesome. the Trogues one Good. at a later date. Yeah, yeah. So okay, we'll be doing so tr- three total for now. Yeah, right on, right on. I, I I reach out to them often to just let them know that we've been admiring their journey from afar, and that's uh, you know that's. Anybody who goes through this process is, um, you know, there's definitely something to be said for it, but especially in, in their case. Um, and they've been making, you know, quite a statement for years. Uh, and it's, it's appreciated because if there's one thing our industry lacks, for sure, and we've all talked about this and been on panels about this. And, um, you know, it's just it's really nice and refreshing to see. Uh, it be a change becoming more apparent and uh, never, never so needed. So yeah, they're they're great. And again, I think Steph, I told you this last time I saw you. I can't remember what we spoke about exactly, but if that's if you know if that shows one thing about the brewing industry, uh, one of them put up a, a post the other day. I mean, well, it was on their public page, and um, and they said that uh, you know you don't see two pizza places doing this you know what i mean like there's always the argument that you could have more than one pizza place in the town but you don't see those two pizza places like collaborating so uh i think it's quite a statement about the industry in general and what i feel like i've been saying is dead for years but now i'm seeing it coming back more than ever so it's really great yeah definitely yeah he brought up that same analogy uh with us when we interviewed him and it's it's a really good point it's an industry like like no other in in the sense of collaboration and just you know everybody working together yeah uh, co- yeah much more yeah cooperation and i don't know i just i feel like there's a, a very it's a young mindset maybe it's naive of me to to like excuse it that way but uh folks who have not been a part of this industry you know whether as uh consumers or pr- producers manufacturers employees of whatever it is um even if they've just sort of been industry adjacent they don't really understand that uh, that code of responsibility to your community and and to uh, to the to the product. It's 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 changing and it's shifting, but this all shows that it's maybe not, or maybe shifting back, or maybe just maturity. I don't know, but it's it's very refreshing. It's definitely something I think has been stronger on the production industry side than the consumer side. Historically, as far as like that, the the collaboration mentality, um, and I think it's only been diminished on the consumer side just because the consumer side has grown so much so fast that, like you said, 
a lot of people, people who work in the industry, have at least been paying attention to it for a while. So they do kind of get that old school, we're all in this together thing that's always been there. But maybe a lot of the newer consumers aren't aware of the culture of the industry that's been around for so long. But things like this, like this Black is Beautiful collaboration that coincide with uh, broader societal issues that everybody's paying attention to, do also serve to highlight that sort of positive side of the craft beer industry that is going to be, you know, consumers are now going to see, even like you said, the younger consumers just getting into it are going to see that, wow, this is an industry that's kind of unique in that respect. Yeah, 100%, which, and it's exciting. Uh, and, and those broader societal issues, uh, you know, they've always been there. It's nothing, it's nothing new, but breweries have always been this communal meeting meeting place uh or again i just think that breweries and brewers have had a, a responsibility to their community to uphold uphold and you know uh i don't want to say we had it too good for too long because i don't know that i ever really felt that way personally but um the industry just took some interesting detours um and then also with increased consumer has also been of course increased uh uh, production houses and how those how those were achieved you know with with the the commonwealth of pennsylvania is a great example with its sort of loosening of the law or legislations being t typically a bit more friendly towards uh taproom activity and things it did seem a little bit more like a uh capitalistic venture that was worthwhile beyond the like passion of brewing and you do have a lot more non-brewers getting into the industry like Hey, opening a brewery is a good idea. That's like hot right now. And I don't know, you know, some, and I've said these words too. Like some people will say the wrong reasons. That's not fair for me to say they are different reasons, but uh, the unwritten code is not necessarily adhered to because, uh, well, they, 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 they don't know about it. You know, it's just, it's not maybe in their nature or in their business plan or in their ideals. And therefore, it would never translate to their business unless, you know, there's some sort of systemic change, which, again, broader societal issues have been absolutely uh, bringing to the forefront. And it's exciting. Um, <laughs> it's as exciting as it is uh, daunting of a, of a task right now, because public safety is like, well, I'm sure this will come up, but it's just like, I don't even know who's concerned with it anymore. And it's like getting kind of scary and weird and um but it is exciting to see that change, certainly. Definitely, definitely. All very good points. So uh, before we transition to perhaps another topic, we got real deep real quick, but we do want to introduce you. For our final conversation of this episode, uh, we have uh, another friend of the show who uh, his brewery has taken part in the Black is Beautiful campaign and collaboration and uh, has gotten us drunk off some pretty good beers otherwise <laughs> before. And Wayne was kind enough to bring me a, a crowler from his recent visit. We have joining us Sam from Bond Place Brew. And Sam, how are you, man? Yeah, hey, good. Uh, really well. I, I just realized that the crowler machine was probably clouding our conversation. Um, and and uh, I don't know what kind of creative editing you're going to do here, but... <laughs> Well, so I, that the, the first part where I didn't know how to use Zoom, <laughs> um, and I think I answered that question a little bit differently. See, this is where like the actor side really comes in handy because it's like there's there's no dishonesty. I, I mean, I'm going to be honest either way. I'm not going to say I'm doing great, but uh, I could do like the whole like I'm doing great. This is wonderful. <laughs> I love operating a brewery during a pandemic. It's awesome. Yeah, right. <laughs> Well, as far as the sounds go, we find that incidental brewery sounds only add to the authenticity of the podcast. So we're totally cool sure. with it. Oh, yes. right. right. It on. proves that you're actually working, Sam. Yeah, that's or, true. Or or it's that creative acting side. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. Are you really good at Foley as well? <laughs> Quick, yeah. Quick, Tina, turn on the, uh, the thing that makes beer. Turn on What's the thing that name? makes beer. What, what, what's their name? Empty the beer uh, tank now. Yeah. What's that one called? Uh, um, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it is part of... Uh, Part of what's been great about this whole process, actually, because, you know, I'd like to maybe not dwell on the negative so much. I've been working at that. But part of what's been great <clears throat> is being more involved in uh, production side again, which I haven't had that luxury in a, in a few years. Uh, it's just that trying to become more involved with the production side while maintaining the uh, 
the uh, interface side, the cu you know the, uh, the customer interface side, is uh, it's, it's interesting to navigate. And at the beginning of all this, I said, uh, you know, it's sort of like I'm the captain of a ship in like in the Caribbean or something. It's like beautiful, and the waters are pristine, and I'm getting these like you know these alerts on my radio, and everybody's saying, "Careful, the waters are going to get really treacherous." And I'm like looking around, there's not a cloud in the sky, so. Uh, well, we've weathered a few storms and we're not through it yet, but here we are somewhat on the other side of something. I guess we're sort of on an island right now. Yeah, it's yeah, kind of hard to tell where we yeah. are with all this because there's that looming danger of it's all going to come back and we don't know how strong it'll be. And, you know, we have some people still have the scars from the fresh wounds even from having to fight through it the first time. Right. There's oh, absolutely. That crawler machine. And, now there's a uh, sound. I just, I just got off. The other, oh, wow. It is that loud, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, that last I one particularly. I just got to, yeah, that's the, uh, that's the, uh, the flux capacitor. Engaging. I think, oh, I think we, sp we spoke about that last time. Ooh, yes. <laughs> fun fact. Today is the 35th anniversary of back to the future. Is it really? Yeah. Oh, July 3rd, 85. Cool. Nice. Well, there you go. And what was the, uh, so what was the, uh, November, November 3rd, November 5th, whatever. 15th, 1955, I believe. I thought it was October. No, it's definitely November. The enchantment under the sea dance. Yeah. 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 That's what I'm thinking. But anyway, anyway, um, yeah, sorry. I, I wish uh, I wish a lot of things. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think we all do. <laughs> I, I, I wish I wouldn't talk about things that I know just enough about. Um, well, yeah, including including my favorite movie of all time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, so I just got off the phone with a friend of mine. We're, I'm supposed to go to a wedding. I'm actually supposed to be like the the. Uh, I forget what my exact title is, but like the master of Oktoberfest ceremonies. My my best friend's getting married to a, a gal from Wisconsin, and like you know they're they're very uh, German. You know that they celebrate that heritage, and and my friend's Austrian, and he's in love with that culture and heritage as well as far as what he celebrates personally. And they had asked me to be you know as, of course as as a brewer and all these things like master of Oktoberfest ceremonies. With this was more than a year ago, and things have changed quite a bit. And I just got off the phone with another friend. He's like, can you believe that? Like this wedding's still going on. And like, what are you going to do? And I'm like, listen, you know, I don't know. I, I, cause now this is August coming up and I, am I willing to go out to this wedding and then come back and then quarantine myself for two weeks from my business and my family? Uh, I mean the sound of a two week vacation or that doesn't sound too bad, but you know, what, what I'm neglecting to think about is actually just like also personal safety um you know i, I that kind of went out the window and i had to think about that for a moment i was like dude you know like it's not it's not just your family and friends and co-workers and, and you know customers you gotta think about you gotta think about you so um yeah it's just it's really tough to navigate right now i don't know there's no else way, no other way to say it yeah it's it's a weird balancing act and and you know i uh, you know we as a podcast have have reacted and had to change but you know this isn't our livelihood. This is just something we do because we enjoy doing it. And, you know, it, it generates enough revenue to sustain itself. And that's about it. So, right. you know, our pivoting, like, you know, we, we just talked at the beginning of the show, like we've slowly been upgrading our equipment to do this sort of uh, uh, over uh, video call podcasting. But that's not really a luxury as, a, a, you know, a fully functioning operating business that is like feeding people. Um, you have to pivot and pivot quickly. To, to keep up in a situation like this and and you know something that's come up a lot since we've been doing these these socially distant episodes is how am amazing breweries have been at reacting and keeping not not just like keeping their business flowing but keeping their business flowing in a safe and responsible way that also continues to serve the consumers and even taking advantage of an opportunity to introduce themselves to new consumers by doing like delivery and that kind of right. thing and all this online ordering that has popped up um, I was recently up in the Bethlehem area uh, because my girlfriend and I take uh, regular pilgrimages to vegan treats. And, oh, uh, yeah, sure. We uh, we swung by, and I bought a couple of uh, uh, crawlers uh, from Bomb Place. That, uh, we did the curbside pickup, just pulled up. They said, what color is your car? Where are you? Popped out, dropped them off. Super cool, quick and easy. So it's really cool to see, you know, you know, you said it's tough to navigate, but it's cool to see the how as a small business, you're able to be nimble enough to, to change your operations to meet the moment. Sure. It's been constant adaptation and, uh, I'm, I'm really proud of everybody 
here and it really showed me that uh, this, this team that I have behind me, but also it is reflective of the industry. And I think the Black is Beautiful is a great uh, campaign that shows, you know, that even through thick and thin, we can, you know, because it, it would be very easy to maintain um, whether it was an excuse or what, you know, oh, you know, now, now is not the time to do that. Well, I would argue now is the perfect time, you know, um, as far as that's concerned in our history, you know, we've, we've always been committed to uh, uh, multiple types of fundraisers and, and events, uh, you know, raising awareness or directly providing funds or some sort of relief, whether it was, you know, something global like the, uh, the resilience, or if it were something far more local, like, uh, you know, our, our more hyper local campaign of, uh, of what we, what we do with pink boots every year, um, and then donate back to CACLV, uh, you know, in, in the case of black is beautiful, uh, we, uh, we're very much going to, uh, be working in that vein with local businesses. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm not, well, I'm free to speak, you know, obviously my personal opinion, but bond places opinion can vary slightly from my personal opinion. It just so happens that it seems like everybody who works here, uh, at least, and by seems like, as far as I know, is on the same page as me, um, so, but I do have to be leery on just sort of like speaking on their behalf. And that's where social media gets a little goofy um, or blurred. And it's always tough to make those decisions because even if I start a, a post with like, hey, Sam from Bond Place here, and I make it personal, um, that's still reflective and, uh, and it becomes indicative of my opinion. So, um, you know, we've, we've done quite a few donations through this process. Pink Boots did raise... I think we ended up raising close to $600 this year. You know, we were looking more towards uh, $2,000, but with uh, crowler sales and um, growler fills, you know, diminishing uh, profits on that. But we were still able to do that. And uh, I think our industry shows time and time again, adaptability and being able to maneuver through tricky situations. But um, it is at quite a cost and it's, it's, uh, I don't know. I think something about that camaraderie actually helps uh, because, you know, you know, you're not alone. You know, you're you know, there's other people and um, businesses with you. Uh, if you were solo, it'd be a lot more, I, I think, a lot tougher. Well, for me personally. Um, but I think the Black is Beautiful campaign uh, shows, you know, uh, solidarity and unity. And in that way, uh, what the cool thing is for us is like, look, I'm not going to speak about defund the police and I'm not going to speak about uh, other campaigns that we're not necessarily donating to um, you know we could always talk personally about how I feel about it it's, it's not that I'm against it that's not at all what I'm saying um, I just don't want to misalign my, my myself or my brand with anything and that's what I think ends up potentially happening um, <laughs> when I when I go on Instagram and say fuck Trump and all this stuff <laughs> yeah. it's all good and well that I actually <laughs> feel that way um, but you know, if we're going to preach hate has no home here in community, I have to be very careful about that stuff. Yeah. And uh, it goes a little deeper than, than that too, I would argue, because we're in a culture that is very much the cancel culture. So if you say something that gets misconstrued one way or another, uh, you know, you're, somebody's going to call for a boycott and other people are going to follow along. And it's just, it's a risk that you may not be willing or able to take. Well, and that happened a few weeks ago here. Oh, really? <laughs> we had a social... Oh, yeah. We had a uh, quite a social media meltdown. Uh, I keep saying thanks a lot, Nicolini, but um, <laughs> I, I, I realize maybe I'm closer to Boomer than I am uh, Millennial. Or that <laughs> but, Sounds um, about right. So, I, uh, yeah, well, you uh, actually, uh, case in point, let's uh, let's talk about me trying to join a Zoom call. <laughs> and have uh, but, yeah, I, I used uh, a term that I did not know misaligned me or my brand and and you know something i felt very strongly about um but you know i, I, I it, it totally misaligned me and it made me realize like the power of these words and like right now um so that is that is why we've uh, we've decided especially um in the case of black is beautiful to donate to um black owned businesses uh and uh uh you know ho hopefully continue our commitment to the uh to uh, purchasing through uh, just being more conscious and aware of conscientious and aware of where we get our supplies from in every way, uh, you know, from from our coffee to 
to our our mall you know um supporting businesses that are in line with what we how we feel or you know actually beyond fighting uh fighting for the cause but a part of it you know a big part of it so um yeah that was quite a lesson for me uh luckily most people who know me and know the brand were like calm down you're fine <laughs> like we know we know what you stand for uh we appreciate the apology and i was just like I, I'm leaving my cell phone at home from now on <laughs> and not writing anything ever again. Um, but yeah, so uh, so we uh, can we talk about Black is Beautiful? Yeah, I, I was actually going to say that's a perfect point to transition to. It's, it was you guys and uh, Country Club Correct. doing yours as well. Uh, and that was only a couple of weeks ago that you did it. Now, when are you expecting that beer to release? So we did ours, our, our interpret. So country club and bond place have, uh, you know, personal relationships and, uh, business relationships, uh, transcending this, this, this brew, they're actually opening right down the street and they've been, um, customers of ours for, you know, uh, I would say two years now. And, um, we've sort of admired each other from afar and had uh, a fun, playful relationship, uh, including like joking around with our employees, and I say joking around because I think they're really going to try to do this, but, uh, you know, trying to pay them more to have them work for them and these types of things. So, um, <laughs> one of the, uh, one of the ploys was, uh, Mike from country from country club, uh, said that, uh, he would make Kevin a coconut stout because Kevin likes coconut stouts and that's not necessarily in bond places wheelhouse. Uh, so, uh, to entice Kevin to go work over there, so I said, well, why don't we make Black is Beautiful a coconut imperial stout uh, dry hopped severely, <laughs> like super heavily with uh, Sabro. <laughs> so um, that's what we did. And um, the, it, it's, uh, it's, a little, it's a little like hoppy right now. I think it's going to take, I think it's going to be a two or three more weeks. It's also a 10% beer. I mean, I typically like to take my time with these types of beers. But the plan is right now to have it on draft here in the tap room and in cans. And again, the proceeds from the sales will be going to uh, to uh, black owned businesses, specifically breweries. Uh, so those breweries are unaware of that at this point. But um, well, everybody will see when it happens. Uh, I kind of want to keep them unaware, uh, although I think that unfortunately there's not many. But, you know, uh, hopefully, uh, you know who you are and <laughs> we're proud to be part of the, uh, you know, the funding of wonderful things like uh, diversity in our industry. Yeah, and that's really cool. And I think one of the coolest things about the collaboration is, one, leaving it up to the breweries to decide what they do with their donations, who they want to give it to, how they want to, you know, what what specific entities they want to donate to, obviously within the guidelines of helping communities of color. Um, and also the freedom to, to mess with the beer recipe. Like you said, you're an imperial coconut stout dry hopped is you know not the original recipe but a very cool spin on it um and really cool that you had the flexibility to say you know what we're going to do with our with our donations is give it give to the 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 um black owned um breweries in in the community which is a, i think a really cool idea yeah this is i mean that's our brotherhood and that's something that i felt very strongly about you know for a long time and i mean there's no hiding it right i mean like until more recently, you didn't have many people of any, like you didn't have females in the spotlight. I mean, it was like Jim Cook and Sam Calgioni, but you did have Garrett Oliver. You know, there was, there was, uh, there was an opportunity to recognize that our industry wasn't dismissive. It just attracted or whatever. I don't know what, why I, you know, that's, we, you could go to a BOP meeting and talk about it until you're, you know, blue in the face. And, um, uh, I don't, I don't know that well, I'm sh and I'm sure there are in Pennsylvania, but I don't, I don't associate myself with any that are like any breweries that are specifically like, no, 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 we would never hire somebody like that or something. Um, it's just, I, you know, whatever, there's tons of, uh, variables to consider, but at the end of the day, it's really like things are changing and for the, for, in my opinion, for the better, and we're seeing it. And if we can somehow be a part of that, um, encouraging that diversity, but also, uh, increasing the, it's almost like it's, it's hopefully going to propagate more, uh, more brewers of multiple, uh, backgrounds, you know, like this is going to encourage people to say like, Hey, wow, like I actually enjoy this culture and I don't feel like it's dismissing me because of the color of my skin or my race or my creed or any of these things, you know, my religion, 
Um, it's actually always been, well, I don't know about that, but uh, I feel like American craft beer has, that's what American craft beer is about. It's, it's not only diversity of style, but it's also um, the appreciation of just the opportunity of diversity. Yeah, I've said it for years that there's a, a certain level of camaraderie, and you know, we even referenced it earlier in the beer community, but it also is a relatively progressive industry, too. Uh, I mean, there's, I would argue, no better example of that than Black is Beautiful getting over 900 breweries in all 50 states and 17 countries. Like, it's now, it's a, now eight, 18, 18, 18 countries. 18 countries. Now. Who is the 18th? Oh, what's the 18th country? Yeah. I don't know. I just ah, the numbers. I want to know. <laughs> uh, but that's even better. 18 countries. There's now a worldwide thing that's happening that 900 breweries across the world are saying that we're going to pledge to this and we're going to support this kind of positive change and positive momentum. Right. Okay. And, and there, you know what's also great about it is there's no obligation. I mean, of course, I'm sure that there's pressure from people's customers somewhere uh, I don't know. We didn't end up feeling it because we signed we signed on very early on when, when Marcus and Weather Souls had announced it. Um, Cromer, Mike, uh, Mike and Jose reached out to me and said, like, hey, did you see this? And I said, yeah, I just did. And, you know, we already signed on. But do you want to do it with us? Because I think they had already signed on as well. We were pretty early on as far as I could tell. And, and I, by the graces of God, I somehow saw this because, <laughs> you know, I don't see these things too often. Like I saw a post. Uh, outlining it um, and I don't know if we I'm sure we would have felt well I guess we would have because I did get a lot of people reaching out to me like hey did you see this and I said not only did we see it we're already registered as a, a particip participatory brewery but I'm wondering you know um, if a lot of breweries did it out of feeling pressure I don't I don't I don't think that's the case um, you know, I don't think a lot of breweries felt the pressure to do it I, I hope that it's not just a marketing opportunity, but at the same time, even if it's just a marketing opportunity, but that money is going where it should, as long as it's being genuine in that way, I guess that's, that's half the battle. But uh, what I'm trying to say is like, I like that there's no obligation to do these types of things. But the breweries, uh, we take it upon ourselves to do these types of things. And, uh, you know, in, again, my opinion is it's the right thing to do, but um, I feel like uh, you know that it's it's a lot to ask a business to just be like hey all the money you make off of this thing donate it um especially I don't, after a pandemic you know when when margins were very low to begin with right right yeah so yeah exactly i mean we saw it we saw it with any of our donations through the pandemic uh whether it was a local business whether it was uh the hispanic community center of lehigh valley whether it was caclv whether it was miller keystone for uh you know, we would do the best we could. So like maybe we couldn't donate money to Miller Keystone, but we could encourage people to go donate blood. Um, I think a, a beer like this is a perfect opportunity. You know, I've been saying it a lot lately, like uh, everything is very black and white right now. And uh, especially um, with what's going on, you know, I kind of feel like, again, going back to like aligning or misaligning yourself or um, just picking a side, it, an opportunity like this really shows where you stand um, and you can stand firmly. And I think there's a lot of people who were afraid to stand before, uh, but now that they know their solidarity and they have, you know, they have others with them. Um, that's the camaraderie and that's the cooperation that I love seeing in our industry. And quite frankly, you're going to hear this from a lot of brewers. I'm sure uh, you yourselves are, are, are part of this. I mean, I don't know what do you can do. You consider yourself industry adjacent adjacent. Cause I mean, there's, there's more than just breweries in the industry. I mean, of course, there's um, enthusiasts and uh, consumers, uh, but you know, it, it gives everybody a voice and an opportunity to stand in a legion, an alliance with this type of thing. Um, Absolutely. And clearly, it's important to you all too, because we wouldn't be talking about it if it wasn't. And that's yeah, the, the very point I was going to bring up when you're talking about the motivations behind breweries participating. You know, regardless of what it is, and obviously it's the overwhelming majority of people being participating in this is because they believe in it, not because they want to sort of, you know, say, look at what good thing we did. Uh, give us your money. But um, also, like, regardless of any of that, like, we're having this conversation now, this entire episode, you know, now this final segment, we are just a bunch of white people sitting around talking about it. But <laughs> we spent the whole episode, you know, connecting with people of color in the industry. We're talking with you about the, the people you've worked with, with black owned businesses and and things like that. And this is. 
something that comes up at like roundtable discussions, like you said at like uh, uh, BOP events and things like that. But it's just something you talk about because it's it's on the agenda of things to talk about. But the moment now and the th- everything going on now and this collaboration and this whole project has really said to everybody like this isn't just something we need to like discuss as an ongoing thing. This is something we need to address directly and head on and say like really seriously what are we going to do how are we going to how are we going to broaden because one of the things that's come up in our conversations particularly in this episode and specifically when we we talked to marcus which i I referenced in our last interview because i found it really poignant was you know making the the case that yes the beer industry is inclusive and open but it's still dominated by white guys even if those white guys are like willing to work with anybody there's still not a lot of people of minorities in the industry. Now it is changing, but you know, the face of the industry is bearded white guy and right. You know, all those bearded white guys are very open-minded, but they're still most of the people in the industry. Sure. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you, it's, it's, it's so tough to get away from that. Um, And it's, it's like, I don't want to say it's not our fault. That's not, that's not what I'm trying to say, but like at the end of the day, you know, so like both my, my parents are both immigrants, right? And um, we, I grew up in southern New York in a very like, uh, well, I'm from New York City originally, so you can imagine it was very diverse. And um, uh, I grew up in southern New York, which was a little less diverse, but um, uh, we, we weren't the only uh, family of immigrants, but we were also Italian. It's not like, you know, there's anything super like, uh, we'll say exotic or, uh, different. There's many Italian Americans, um, and I think very often uh, that get you get lumped into like a subgroup. Like, oh, you're Italian American, you must be these things. Um, and I think that happens to brewers often. And uh, I also feel like what you just said about them being these bearded white guys may be a little bit more open minded, but. How do you how do you encourage uh, how do you encourage that diversity and discourage the like the like the assumptions you know like oh these people must be like this because they're this you know um, I don't know I, I think that's that that's a much bigger question um, and that's that's why we have these panel discussions but it is under obligation like how do we how do we just talk about it and figure it out I don't know you know but. I think this collaboration is a great example of of showing people where we stand and as an industry um, and uh, hopefully just like get, get rid of that mythos that I don't know. I, I don't know what mythos I'm trying to even what myth I'm trying to bust, but um, I, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with any of it. Actually. <laughs> I think I just was just getting things out of my brain as we're talking. That yeah. Happens. Well, there's, there's a lot in, in, I think collectively all of our brains that needs to come out because this is a time where there's a lot of things going on and, and we need to process it somehow. And you're right. This collaboration is a sign of the changing times and it's something that we are very happy to see. And, and I'm sure you're very happy to be part of, and I can't wait to try as many of these beers as I can from as many breweries as I can, not just to see what they've done with the style, but because I want to support those that are supporting this as a consumer. Oh, we yeah. need to do a yeah. follow-up super tasting episode. Where oh, we just that's get a good idea. As many yes. of them as we can and compare them and get super drunk. Cause a lot of them are high in alcohol. <laughs> that's a great yeah. idea. Ours is uh, ours clocked in at the uh, proposed ten percent. Ten percent, yeah, we, it's amazing. We, we pretty much followed the recipe. Uh, you know, again, just added coconut. We we did five coconut additions. Uh, I'll tell you the story about how I almost burned my house down sometime. Um, <laughs> that is, of course, I mean to say how I burned my house down, and I'll tell you that story sometime. Um, All right, but, I like that. Uh, a little teaser. <laughs> Maybe over, uh, maybe over a coconut imperial stout, but then yes. we also, like I said, we we did dry hop it pretty heavily with Sabro. It's it's really cool. I mean, I we've never really done a beer like this. This is far more in, in country clubs uh, wheelhouse, or from what I could see about weathered souls, I've never been there or I've never had the pleasure of enjoying their beers. But um, actually, country club would be interesting. Uh, their friend, they're they're actually uh, as far as I know, I'm pretty sure Mike and. Yeah, um, Mike and uh, Marcus are friends. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, I was gonna say I think Country Club and Weathered Souls are uh, friends beyond beyond before this, so it's pretty awesome. Well, I've actually had the pleasure of being at Weathered Souls two, three years ago, 
and it's quite an impressive space and their beers are quite delicious. So, I mean, I, I kind of would like to drive down there right now to get their rendition. <laughs> Theirs is being released in real time tomorrow on July 4th. Oh, whoa, I think we cool. looked on Google maps and it was like 25 hours to drive. Whoa. There straight back. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, so, you know, that, that brings up something important too. I think that that's a really awesome statement and I'm sure it was with the intention that, that I assume it was. Um, I think people just need to be aware of what they're celebrating tomorrow. I would never, I would never say don't celebrate the Fourth of July or Independence Day. Again, you know, my my family's not even from this country. Uh, I was born here, and uh, uh, I have my feelings about what independence and freedom mean. But I think this is the year that people really need to think twice before they just like. You know, it's a Saturday, so you have the day. Most people have the day off or whatever. I don't know. I guess I, I don't. I don't know what that term means day off but um <laughs> uh i think this that's a really awesome opportunity to make a even even bolder broader statement with this beer it's like not only are we doing this in collaboration with 18 you know 18 countries 900 breweries um but also we're this is coming out on on independence day and i, I think that's really important um so that's really awesome i'm glad to hear that i, I was not aware of that sam thank you yeah it's oh, yeah. always good to chat with you, um, and we will take you up on that Imperial Stout and the conversation about your house burning down. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, you're not yeah. allowed though. You're not allowed to tell us that story unless we're sitting behind microphones recording it, <laughs> right? Because that needs to be recorded. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. Cool. Then I I stop there. But thank you guys. Thank you for dealing with me always. Um, oh, it's a pleasure for for everybody everybody listening. You could. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure if if me trying to join the call makes the final edit, you'll uh, you'll be able to appreciate how difficult it was for me to even get to this point. <laughs> Self-proclaimed but, uh, Captain Techno <laughs> Wizard here. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know maybe I came back from the future and deemed myself Captain Techno Wizard. I don't know. Maybe you did. That's, but, that's- uh, that's hopeful, right? Maybe that's why your call is yeah. audio only because the video is too good for our equipment. That could be because <laughs> it's from the future. <laughs> it's 25K. <laughs> yeah, it's 25K. In Jeez. 4K. <laughs> oh, before we uh, let you go, Sam, I had one last thing I wanted I wanted to tell you. I got a growler filled at a place, I don't know, like two weeks ago, and the growler I took with, I didn't even realize at the time, had your drawing of Moo on the cap oh, that he did oh, for okay, me all those yeah. years ago. <laughs> Did they, uh, did, they under, did they understand it? Or they, uh, were like, they didn't ask any questions. They, <laughs> I think they just wanted to fill it and let me go. I did it all for the movie. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> that was, yeah, that was, I think that was, uh, that was a running inside joke, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, it was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right on. Well, uh, yeah, cool. Anyway, <laughs> um, send my love. I'm going to get back to the uh, crowlers here. And, uh, yeah, we'll have four packs of delicious Imperial Stout for you at some point in the future. Uh, Beautiful. Can't and, uh, wait. Cap- Captain Techno Wizard will be there. All right. <laughs> Looking forward Good to, to it. Sam, thank you so much, man. Yeah, thank you, thank Sam. you, guys. Take care. Thank you. You too. Bye. Get back to work. <laughs> well, there you have three conversations from three different breweries, all involved in different capacities in the Black is Beautiful campaign. Uh, of course, starting with the guy who began the whole project, Marcus Baskerville, who's the founder of Weathered Souls Brewing. We had Tim from Harris Family Brewing, and of course, just talked to Sam from Bond Place. It just occurred to me during our interview with Sam, we never actually mentioned, for anyone who doesn't know, Bond Place is in uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Yeah. yeah. Right by the uh, Sands Casino. Been around for years. We did an episode there a couple of years ago. Uh, Sam is one of our uh, idols in the industry. He's one of the cool guys yeah. that we've gotten to know along the, along the our journeys, and uh, really cool to have him on the show again. Yeah, very much so. Uh, and it's it's great to see such widespread adoption of the project. And, you know, all, all three of our guests have mentioned that it's, you know, they, they want to see and they are trying to enact the positive change that I'm sure we all want to see in not just the beer industry, but overall. And this is a very powerful way that's a more or less grassroots campaign to do what they can do. And I'm not kidding when I say I can't wait to try as many of these as I can. And I really hope we do the, the follow up. We're going to get shit face drinking all these different versions i mean of they're it. probably going to be have to be like the local versions uh yeah to make it happen logistically unless steph is really driving to texas because <laughs> mm, i would love we'll to see. have the original <laughs> <laughs> let me know if you do because i might have a, a request of oh, course boy. of course i would i'll give you one guess i think it's also important to mention that even though we might not be breweries and we're not brewing this collaboration beer um that we are uh 
purposefully podcasting perhaps right now. And this is something that's very important to us. And we are also committed um, to change and uh, positive change. And, and um, this isn't something that's just going to be one episode. And then we, we move on as normal. I think we've all internally reflected and we've experienced some really great conversations and we are also committed to this cause. Very much so. Definitely. And one thing that, that this whole situation um, really brought up in my mind was like looking at the history of our podcast, most of the people we've had on are, are white dudes. You know, that's and, and that's a reflection of the industry that we're we're involved in. But I think it's it's past time for us to try to make the effort to change that a little bit. Now, we've made the effort to, to have on a lot of women involved in beer, uh, largely because, you know, Steph is the the the, beer, the brewologist among us. Um, so sort of getting that I- involved. But, um, yeah, it's something that, I, I you know, probably we should have thought about long before now. But we're we're thinking about it now and. And like Steph said, it's not just like, okay, we're going to do this now and then we're done. Like this is something we need to internalize and and assimilate into what we do going forward. Well, uh, we need to thank again our, our guests for joining us. And um, it's it's been a very interesting ride, very interesting conversations, very powerful conversations. In lining up the interviews for this episode, we reached out to more of our friends in the uh, beer industry to see if anyone would be able to come on and talk about how they were participating in the collaboration. Now, we got responses from a couple of friends who weren't able to come on to talk about it. However, we did want to pass along the details from them. The first comes from our friends at Poor Man's Brewing and Moo Duck. They did a collaboration. Uh, they basically took the, the recipe and changed it into a black IPA with Cascade and Vic Secret Hops. It's currently on tap at both locations, and uh, they're going to donate all the sales of the beer to the Lancaster YWCA, who holds a Race Against Racism event every year. And the other comes from our friends at Evil Genius. Trevor let us know the details of their brew. Uh, They expect it to release the end of July. They basically followed the recipe by the book, and then they added raspberry and blueberry puree to post-fermentation. And all of their proceeds are going to be donated to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Now, obviously, we are local to central and eastern Pennsylvania, and uh, most of our listenership is as well. Now, if you happen to find yourself outside of this area, take a look around and see what breweries around you have taken part in in this uh go through their websites their social media or you can go to black is beautiful dot beer and you can check out uh, the participating breweries there too and we really hope that you know wayne like you said and steph like you said like it's not just a one episode and we go on as we usually did i really hope this will spark some institutional change and fundamental change for the way people approach their lives and society as a whole and i really genuinely want to do a whole episode with tim (laughs) from harris family he was really cool to talk yeah definitely (laughs) I just want to have some beer with him and sit and chat. Yeah, yeah. I don't even need a microphone. That I was just a great that, conversation. Yeah. I just want to like pick his brain. Yeah, that that would be great. That would be great. Um, remember, you know, you out there, it, it seems weird to even mention where you can follow us. But we're on know, the internet, people. Yeah, you know how to find us. We're and called beer busters. Same thing for all of our guests. Please go out, seek their breweries, seek out the Black Is Beautiful project. Which this one, I will say again, their website for the whole project is blackisbeautiful.beer. dot beer. Uh, and you can find out all the breweries from all around the world that are taking part in this wonderful, wonderful project. Thank you for listening to this, and, and hopefully you'll be able to take some good bits away from this and, and really reflect on what's important out there. I think there's no other way to, to say this does bring us to the end of another episode, and... I'm glad we got to do this. I'm really glad we got to have this conversation, and I, I want to keep having it. Um, like we said, find us online. Find the Black is Beautiful campaign online. Um, support. One of those moments where you realize our outro music is way too long. It really is. <laughs> it really is. I was going to mention other things, but it just doesn't feel right. Yeah. You know. Be good. Be kind. Drink beer. Don't forget to love each other. Exactly. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. It's still going. It's still going. <laughs> How much time is left? Wait, this is the end. Wait, there it is. <laughs> Finally. End meeting.